الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء ما يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعسهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم امين يا رب العالمين so <coughs> continuing on Iqbal's thoughts today and today what I will say, inshallah, will benefit all of us because it is the beginning of his critique. And uh, <coughs> so let me just uh, read from what he wrote and then I will comment on what Iqbal said after that. So I'm reading from where I kind of left off last time. In the absence of such a method, the demand for a scientific form of religious knowledge is, the only, is only natural, he writes. In these lectures, which are undertaken at the request of Madras Muslim Association and delivered at Madras Hyderabad, Aligarh, I have tried to meet, even though partially, the urgent demand by attempting to reconstruct Muslim religious philosophy with regard to philosophical tradition of Islam and the more recent developments in various domains of human knowledge. So the present moment is quite favorable for such an undertaking. Classical physics has learned to criticize its own foundations. As a result of this criticism, the kind of materialism which it, ori it originally necessitated is rapidly disappearing. The day is not far off when religion and science may discover an unsuspected mutual harmonies. So I'm going to explain what Iqbal says over here. So let me give you an example of what has happened. You know, there was a feminist movement and in the feminist movements, women were seeking their rights. And in the third wave, of, because there was the first wave which happened in the late 1800s, and the second wave happened in the 60s, and then, then you have the third wave. During the third wave of the feminist movement, um, what happened is, as women were saying, men are equal to women, men are equal to women, in the beginning it was fine. In the first wave it was the suffrage movement. In the beginning it was women should be allowed to vote, which is a matter of human rights. That was fine. And in the 60s, you know, it was a little not clear what it was about. And in the third wave, it's been totally not clear what it's about. But what I want to mention is, as the women were saying women rights and we're equal to men, knowledge began to come in that started to show all of a sudden that, wait, there are significant differences between men and women that need to be acknowledged. Uh, we have different methods of communicating. We have different emotional needs. We have a different autonomy, we have different hormones, we have... So, as this kind of became part of the culture, uh, the whole feminazi um, syndrome it became part of the culture, knowledge started to come in that was actually more superior to what was being claimed before, which is that Laysa dhakaru kal untha, that there are significant differences between the male and the female. 
But the culture is already there. The culture was already set. The women were already given a certain view of the world. Rather than seeing men and women as complementing one another, uh, it was seen more as women are equal to men. And then knowledge came in that said, wait, they complement one another. And knowledge is still, as knowledge grows, it keeps saying, yes, there is a complementary nature between men and women. They, like I mentioned, I'll mention this one more time just to be clear, you know, we're different at so many levels that it's significant. We're different biologically. We're different in terms of hormones. We're different in our emotional uh, needs. And we are different in terms of how we communicate. So, but the culture adapted something that was before and knowledge came after. So this part I want to make. The same thing has happened in science. From the time of Descartes to the time of Newton, they established a world view of how is this world. This is a world of matter. And what happened with quantum physics, so that's classical physics, Newton's, you know, Newton's laws, everybody studies Newton's laws. It's part of the, this culture is based upon Newtonian physics, but physical knowledge of the world of physics has gone way beyond classical physics. And the thing is, is that to believe in God, not to believe in God, has so much need God in a mindset of Newtonian physics, is, 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 there isn't much. And I'll share with you why. And so, in Newtonian physics, everything is matter. You study the atom, it's matter. And everything is matter. And everything is like a machine. And if everything is like a machine, if I pick something up and it drops, it's like a machine. All the formulas of the universe are working like a machine. And if everything is working like a machine, then even if there's God, I don't need Him. There's no need for God. And if everything is matter, and if we live in the world of cause and effect, and this is because matter means what? The natural consequence we live in a materialistic world is what? Is everything is cause and effect. And there's nothing beyond cause and effect. And everything is completely linear. That's all there is. Even if there is a God, even if there is a divine, we don't need Him because everything's a machine. We can learn how to fix it and put it back together. Learn how the atom works, fix it. Learn how the cell works, fix it. So, Alama Iqbal says, because what happened after Newton, Einstein came. And with quantum physics, what happened is, we live in this world of matter. And Einstein said, oh, there's no matter. Einstein said, the materialism doesn't exist. See, and let me show you why this is significant for a Muslim. What is this? Money, right? We all see money. But when you ultimately realize that this is zarra, this is just zarrat, these are just empty spaces because an atom is a nucleus with electrons on it, which is 99% what? Empty space. And so we live in a world of empty space. We live in a world where there is nothing, there is no... And in the world of nothing, you have to go beyond cause and effect, which I'll come to you in a second. So Alama Iqbal is saying that in this world of cause, this world that we see, the world we live in, it looks like it's the world of matter. But new knowledge is coming in that is challenging this perception. And this is very important because you... We don't realize that if we, if we begin to see things in the light, and I want to mention here, uh, not only Iqbal, it, not only Iqbal believed we need a new ilm al-kalam, but Sir Sayyid Ahmed also believed we need a new ilm al-kalam. And by the way, people that think Sir Sayyid Ahmed was not religious, this is a misinformation. Sir Sayyid Ahmed, who built the Aligarh University, because there's this thing, oh, if he was... 
he built this and he wasn't that religious. This is not a fact. He was actually very religious. Iqbal, who had a religious attitude, didn't have the beard. So Sayyid had the beard. If you've seen his pictures, he had the beard. When the, when the ministers of the British Empire wanted to meet him and meet his family members, the women of the, uh, the, women, the Christian women wanted to meet his uh, family members, he said no based upon religious law. He said Sharia doesn't allow it. So it's not like he was completely, you know, just completely against Islam and he had these ideas that sometimes we read about because there's, I mean, he made these statements, but his life has been primarily as a religious person. And I think that's very important because people think that, oh, he was an educator and he was educated and he was progressive and therefore he wasn't religious. This idea that he was progressive, therefore he wasn't religious. It's complete, completely not according to history. He was a traditionalist, traditionalist. I don't have time to go into details. But Jamaluddin Abghani also believed we need a new Ilm al -Kalam. Iqbal believed we need a new Ilm al-Kalam. Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan believed we need an Ilm al-Kalam. Meaning what? This is the importance of this. Always the way you view the heavens is how you view yourself on earth. Always. If you looked at the heavens and you saw Mars as God, and Jupiter as God, and Saturn as God, and the Sun as God, then that reflected upon your religious life on earth. But when materialism comes in and they throw away all the gods, and you look at the heavens and you don't see God, that reflects upon our life in this world. Cosmology is the main thing that determines of how we perceive ourselves in this world. How we see the heavens determines how we see ourselves. And so, in the world of Einstein, everything was madda, materialism. Everything is materialism, so run after materialism. Everything is cause and effect. Run after it then. But Einstein comes and says, wait. This world of materialism doesn't really exist. Not only that, it's quite scary when you study the subject of quantum physics. Not only does materialism, because you know an atom has a nucleus and around it is, is electrons, it's 99% space. We're all in a world of a void. There's nothing. That is reality. That is the truth. That is science down to the bare. That this we're, the world of this dollar and uh, a pencil are of the same are made of the same molecules and atoms. There's no we see this and we run after these with our passions, but down to the truth of it, it's become one. And so Iqbal understood that especially how quantum physics affects our theology and our understanding of the world that we live in, because. Quantum physics takes you out of the world of cause and effect. Let me share with you. And then I'll go back to some of the issues. <clears throat> what happened with Einstein? Now, this is going to be surprising for some people. Einstein showed... You see, in the world of cause and effect, everything is constant. Can time, can time stop in our world? Can anyone say, I want to put a pause on time? can't. But Einstein proved it. And later on it was proved even more. When you go at the speed of light, time stops. When you go at the speed of light, time stops. And Steve Hawkins proved in his latest books that when you go through too near a black hole, you will begin to see your past, present, and future. Because gravity is not what we think what it is. It's not what Einstein thought. Oh, I pick up an apple and it falls. That's not gravity. Gravity is the curvature of space and time. Gravity is the curvature of space and time. I don't have time to go into this, but I'm just saying, it's curvature of space and time, and when you go to a heavy set of gravity, like a black hole, what is going to happen is time is going to curve. You're going to see your past, your present, and your future. We live in a world where one thing cannot be in two places at the same time. Right? This is the world of materialism. 
We live in a world where one thing cannot be in two places at the same time. But if you strip the world away to the down to the bare atoms, guess what? One atom can be in several different places at the same time. You want to even know what more interesting than that? This is the really the, the, the crusher. When we are looking and observing light, when human beings, listen to this, this is not science fiction, this is not Star Trek, this is not Star Wars, this is real science. When human beings look at light, it behaves differently than if we're not looking at light. There's a double split, a double slit experiment. You can go on Google and type this in, double slit experiment. If you throw a light and you have a double slit, two holes, and if you're watching the light, it's going to go through the two holes. Each atom is going to go through different holes and make one line on this side, one line on this side, like a double slit. If human beings are not watching light, I turn, off, I turn away human observation from light. Light moves differently. It moves not as a particle, it moves like a wave. When human beings are not looking at light, it goes as waves and it creates multiple hit because when it goes as a wave and each atom goes through both of the slits. Each of the atoms go through both of the holes when human beings are not looking at it and it creates like a wave-like thing on the background of, of, of the, uh, the, the, the screen. There is a world already in place that we're observing that has very, very different laws than the world that we're used to in everyday world, even though everyday world has become kind of...